Bickley and Marotta mornings. Arizona Sports, the local sports leader. Bickley Blast. You know your football team has stepped up in class when you feel wronged by power rankings, like when Sports Illustrated ranks both the Chargers and 49ers ahead of the Cardinals, even though Arizona beat both those teams. But I get the distinct impression that Jonathan Gannon wants no part of power rankings or boisterous headlines or meaningless praise, not when his football team faces their toughest challenge of the season. How do they remain? one of the NFL's hottest teams during a bye week when focus and rhythm can be interrupted when the break is not always a good one. Now, obviously, the Cardinals have a great opportunity here. They've taken advantage of a comfortable schedule where road games to Buffalo and Green Bay happened early, where they have only one cold-weather game left. They've been dominant defensively at home, winning their past three games without a real home field advantage, where the cliche of complimentary football has never been more evident where all three phases are operating and functioning at a very high level. But when this team gets back, they have got four division games, including two and three weeks against Seattle. They play the Rams and 49ers in the final two weeks of the season, and they will have a chance to win the division and stage the second playoff game at State Farm Stadium in the span of two weeks. And that would go a long way in changing the vibe in Glendale. All right, today's Bickley Blast brought to you by my great friends at Chapman BMW. Make luxury attainable. Find them online at chapmanbmw.com. No, I think it's, uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really affect me or what, you know, what we got going. I think we continue to keep the main thing the main thing. And um, I, if anything, I think it gives us, you know, a little time to rest um, and, and come back, come back ready to go. On the subject of getting uh, being ready to go after the mm-hmm. bye when uh, the Cardinals do get back and start preparing for that Seattle Seahawks game, you said something in the blast that I've thought about for a while. And I know the NFL has gotten kudos for this, but you mentioned the Cardinals' last two games are against the Rams in San Francisco, yes. correct? Yes, yes. And people said, yeah, that makes sense. Those last games of the season, especially in, in week 18, those should all be division games. I'm not so sure. Because a lot of times, I think the division game should hold more weight. You only get six of them out of the 17 you play. So you have 11 non-division games, six in-division games. Mm -hmm. I think that ratio is a little wonky, first of all. And then you put the possibility in by scheduling those games late, the in-division games late, that they don't mean anything. Like teams have already, you might have, I mean, the Cardinals could have been 3-13. and right. And, so, so what and, good and are the 49ers they? Then? Could have been thirteen and yeah, three. You get a point. I so can see that. I, I think you kind of write in a situation where, in certain years, you're taking the importance of the at least one division game out, if not two. At the I end can of the see year. that. Yeah. Um, but this will be a tough test because, again, if it, the, the old cliche about you'd never want to take a day off during a hot streak, this is kind of applying to this football team. Now, this is the the whole Cardinal staff's coaching vibe is built for this. That much is clear. They're mm-hmm. they are so much about winning the day and and not looking past the day. Winning they, behavior. Winning behavior. This is this is how they roll. So I, I think out of all coaching staffs, this one is is uniquely equipped to handle this. But again, you're talking about human nature and football players when you talk to them, they'll tell you something happens to them when they get a break. Their body starts to kind of, it, it's like being out in the cold for a long time and you come in and you start to dethaw a little bit and you're like, oh, thank goodness. Mm-hmm. I'm starting to feel normal again. Yeah, It's hard to kind of fire that back up. So, it be. so it's it's something that's going to uh, be a task for this football team. Here's the other thing I want to mention that that isn't said about Jonathan Gannon because uh, the news this morning in the NFL is that the Bears have fired Shane Waldron, the offensive coordinator they never should have hired from Seattle. They could have hired Cliff Kingsbury, but Matthew Eberflus was really terrified of bringing in a, a high name assistant who might take his job. You know this, you. I, People probably would be astounded if they knew how many high-level decisions were made by coaches out of job security or insecurity, if you will, right? And I think we experienced some of that here in the latter years of Cliff Kingsbury and most notably Steve Kahn. But in the case of, of Jonathan Gannon, 
Could he have picked his assistants any better than he did? He brought in a couple. Now, uh, Nick Rollis is a guy he worked with. Yes. And Drew Petzing, but but Drew Petzing wasn't on the Eagles staff. So one of the things that Jonathan Gannon was very smart about was hiring assistants that he knew he could work with, but he knew were going to be successful. It's it it certainly appears that way. Going back to your point on Eberflus, I mean, it's and I totally get your point. And there was the connection between Kingsbury and Caleb Williams mm-hmm. from USC, although Cliff Kingsbury was not the offensive coordinator, which has been wildly reported, yes. by the way. Yes. He was a he was a consultant. So he didn't he wasn't coordinating that offense. But still there was the connection there. But going back to when those hires were made, I don't know if Cliff Kingsbury was all that want I know he got a lot of interviews mm-hmm. but I didn't really see that as a miss okay. necessarily now it might well, Shane just, Waldron certainly was oh it, 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 it's been a disaster yeah. he didn't get didn't get through the year obviously and now there's all kinds of questions on what kind of damage have they done to Caleb Williams but it might come down to the fact that Jaden Daniels is just a better quarterback than Caleb Williams and we were talking about earlier and how this relates to the Cardinals About this ascension and how long it's taken Kyler Murray to get here. This is his sixth year in the league, and it looks like the NFL quarterback light bulb has gone on for him. But you also have to remember, and you talked about being excited and handing him the Mm -hmm. reins of of leadership from day one and how that was pure folly, I think, were the words you used earlier this morning. It was because we forget. We are so blinded as football fans by the brilliance of individual players at the college level that you forget it's a different sport than what they play. Exactly. In the professional ranks. A different world. Yes. That's exactly, yeah, it's a great point. And Caleb Williams is finding that out. Yeah. And Jaden Daniels, to his credit, has acclimated himself very nicely with the tutelage of of Cliff Kingsbury. And and here's the thing with Caleb Williams, and this is why um, he has not been getting good coaching, is he cannot get the ball out of his hands quick. He's still attempting to play the game the way he played it in college on the pro level, and you cannot do that. It's Look, they have got this down to almost a science now. 2.5 2.5 seconds. You hear that all the time. Mm-hmm. That is, that's that's the average length of time for the great pass rushers to get to the quarterback, and that is the number great quarterbacks have to get the football out of their hands. Caleb Williams holds on to it way too long. Over three seconds. Is it really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. You notice, I, I mean, I actually I noticed that from, yeah. in real time that's when it. they played the Cardinals, yeah. and he just holds on, holds on, holds on. He's trying to play the NFL game like he did in college, and you can't do that. No, so everybody's that much faster, that much stronger, that mm-hmm. much more everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Matthew Eberflus uh, of the Bears said uh, yesterday there was going to be changes made. Didn't specify what the changes were. Did say, hey, we're sticking with Caleb Williams at this point, but today the change has come. Uh, Thomas Brown will be the new interim offensive coordinator for the Chicago Bears, and I'm sure that'll fix everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it'll, it'll take the heat off Matthew Eberflus is what it will do. Which... Will it really? Momentarily. Momentarily Briefly. until the end of the season, until that that first Monday after week 18. It's so hot. Because, <laughs> again, the Bears will not go down the road of firing well, a head coach, even though that is a dumpster fire right now. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, and it's not because they're the, it's not a staunch philosophy. It's cheapness. Thanks for watching Bickley and Murata. Click to see the latest Bickley Blast and hit the button in the middle to subscribe to Arizona Sports.